All right, here we go. You guys all had plenty of time to get to the passage. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting from verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Amen. Bow with me again. Uh, Lord, thank you for the opportunity again to worship, um, even in these circumstances. Thank you for those who are here. Uh, thank you for the canopies that are provided uh, to shade us from the sun. Thank you for the breeze to give us a little bit of relief as well, Lord. But mostly we thank you that we can gather together and we can worship you together because we are not a people that are called to worship you isolated or alone. And so, God, would you be honored by that? Would you be honored by our hearts? Would you be honored by our posture before you, God? Thank you as well, Lord, that you are good and upright and that you instruct sinners in the way. And so for me, as a, as a preacher of your word, I am still a sinner yet, and I continue to be. And so I need to be instructed. And your people here, Lord God, need to be instructed, those sinners we are, Lord. And we thank you that you are good and gracious to do so, Lord. And we also thank you that uh, your word will accomplish what you desire to accomplish, Lord, um, and that it will complete um, what you have sent it out to do, God, as Isaiah 55 reminds us. So we thank you. We look to you this day once again. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Brian. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, guys. All right. Um, so, yes, we're in First Timothy 2. Uh, I'm in 1 Timothy 1, and we're finishing up chapter 1. We started it last week. And uh, as you guys recall, if you were here, we um, are talking about Jesus' church. And uh, this letter was written to Timothy by Paul and to the church in Ephesus as instructions for the household of God. Um, and so that's what we find without, uh, throughout this, this letter and, and the rest of the pastoral epistles, which we will you know, go through as well um, in the coming weeks. But the thing that um, I want to remind you of as we kind of review just from last week was, first of all, the importance, the, the essential importance of how the church belongs to God. Right? We know that church is important and it's essential. I know there's been some debate about that, you know, in our uh, current situation and, and what officials think and so forth. But we know if you go to church or if you are a Christian, you should believe that the church is essential. But the reason why we do is because the church belongs to him. It is, it is Christ. It's not ours. It's not mine as a pastor. It's not some leadership. It's not a building, but it's God's church. And so in order to truly be the church as God intends us to be, we must fully understand and completely embrace, trust, delight, um, and delight in the truth that the church belongs to him. The church was his idea. Uh, he created it. He will lead it. He will sustain it. So I mentioned this last time too, if, if you have a problem with the church and you call yourself a follower of Christ, then you have a problem with God. If you think that the church doesn't really matter or you can go without it, I could just follow Jesus, I could just go you know, watch something online, then you have a problem with him. And I don't know, last time I checked, if you have a problem with God, you are not going to win that battle. You are wrong, right? Um, and there's no debate. Um, and so uh, the first thing that we must do, if that's our attitude or that's our posture, is we have to repent. We have to get on board 
with his church, Christ church. And if we've been neglecting or putting it down or drifting away or complaining about it and the people in it, the leadership, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, there's imperfections, of course. But if that's our posture and attitude, then you have a problem with him because it belongs to him. It's his. So that's what we were reminded of, first of all, last week. And then we were reminded last week of the centrality of the gospel, the glorious gospel of Christ. The gospel must be center in the church. Okay? It, it, it must be the foundation of the church. And uh, last week we saw how there was um, danger within the church in Ephesus because there are some people who were teaching different things. They weren't teaching according to the word of God, or they were some things, but they were twisting it. They weren't preaching Christ and keeping that central. Um, and so that needed to be addressed. They were adding or subtracting from the gospel in some way. So Paul exhorts Timothy to guard the gospel, to keep the gospel centered by guarding the gospel. Okay? And that was uh, verses 3 through 11. Um, so we saw the foundational importance of the gospel um, in, in last week's passage. Now, today's passage okay, that we just read Paul continues to write to Timothy about the centrality of the gospel. Um, and, and this time, as he continues to talk about it, I don't know if you caught it, but starting from verse 12 through 17, we see how uh, Timothy, uh, not Timothy, Paul does something that he often does in his letters. As he's talking about Christ, as he's talking about the gospel, as he's talking about something that's theological, right? That's truth-centered, that, that's to renew our minds. It doesn't just stay there. It's not just like, oh, that's a cool thought, or oh, wow, that's that's um, you know that's that's something really. Uh, I it's a moment like, oh, okay, that you know. Um, it was it, it's something that caused him in his emotions and his heart to to have joy, to celebrate what the gospel is and how he has experienced the gospel in his life. So he cannot help but burst out in praise and worship of God and what God has done in his life as he's talking about the truths of the gospel. So it never remains here just with Paul. It always, it always gets to here. It always gets to his heart. And so we see that once again in this passage. His heart and his head are never disconnected. Um, his affections are always connected to the truths that he teaches. So as he's speaking of the utter importance of the gospel and being central to the church, he can't help but celebrate it. So that's what he does. He celebrates the gospel with all his being. And so should we, as his church. We keep the gospel center by celebrating the gospel in our midst, regularly, passionately. We do that in our lives and we do that in our body. Um, so if you're keeping notes... That's the number, that's the two there in terms of keeping the gospel center. The church must guard it, and two, the church must celebrate it. We'll get to three a little bit later. But let's talk about why Paul celebrates the gospel. Why does Paul celebrate the gospel? Well, it's, it's simply because of God's mercy and grace in choosing him and granting him the privilege to be appointed to his service. Right? He says that in verse 12. Oh, Christ Jesus, uh, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy. So even though he had been a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent of Christ, literally, by persecuting Christians before he became a Christian, as a Pharisee, as a religious zealot in that way, um, and even though he had been that opponent, God chose him. God appointed him. God showed him grace and mercy. Now, he does mention how he acted ignorantly in unbelief, but he's not using that as an excuse, as if to say that that's why God showed him mercy, because he was ignorant. No, God's grace was so great that God did not give Paul, first of all, what he deserved, but he gave him undeserved mercy and unmerited grace in the midst of his ignorance, unbelief, and sin. And that's what God has done for each and every one of us, if we're in Christ. Okay. What Paul is not saying, again, is that he was excused in his actions, but that God showed him great grace, overwhelming grace, in his ignorance and misguided zeal. You know, he thought that by persecuting Christians, he was doing something for God. He was being zealous for God's glory. 
but, but God actually had to blind him, literally, on the road to Damascus, blind him with his own glory, reveal himself to Paul. Christ revealed himself to Paul on that road to Damascus, and the grace of Christ overflowed. It overwhelmed him. It overwhelmed him, literally. Um, and, and in that, he became saved, and then he became called to, to be the apostle that God wanted him to be. Right. Now, in verse 15, um, we're introduced to this phrase that is found only in the pastoral epistles, but it's actually used several times in them, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, but in particular, 1 Timothy. And he says in verse 15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Um, perhaps these sayings had become more common in the church uh, by this time, or perhaps this was something that Paul wanted to emphasize and make sure people remembered. Like they, they, they began to speak them and they maybe even memorize them. So it would become like sayings within the church, things that you'd remind each other of as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? Um, but he puts an emphasis here. And, and what is the trustworthy saying he says there? The trustworthy saying is this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I hope that registers with your heart still in some way. I, I, I hope that still stirs you in some way. I know we've heard that before, but, but I hope it still um, registers with your own heart and your own condition and your own awareness of yourself, my own awareness of myself. But this is at the heart of the gospel, this amazing statement. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to reconcile those who were his enemies and under guilt and condemnation to the Father. He came to save those who were rebels, who hate God, who hated God, who were at enmity with God, the Bible tells us. But Christ Jesus came into the world to save people like that, people like you and me. That's what it means to be a sinner. Right? We were enemies of his. We were rebels. We hated him. And yet Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the heart of the gospel. I remember somebody sharing, like, I think when we went through our interview process, membership interview, uh, we asked, how do you know that you're a Christian or what does it mean to be a Christian? And basically they just said, it's, it's, it's to be a sinner who's saved by grace. Right. And uh, in some ways, maybe we were expecting a little bit deeper statement, but that is deep. And that, and that does capture the, the essence, the heart of the gospel in many ways, that we are sinners saved by grace, and that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul adds a personal note to this trustworthy saying. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Of whom I am the foremost. So he's saying there that he's the chief of sinners. He's, he's number one when it comes to sinners. You know, if we had to prioritize or make a list and there are a bunch of people, he would say, I'm first. I'm in first when it comes to being a sinner. Okay. Uh, this wasn't false humility. It wasn't an exaggeration. In his heart and mind, he knew himself to be the worst sinner of them all. Now, there is a subjectivism to this, right? There is that. We, we do have to say, um, you know, if we compare sinners uh, or people that have lived in history, perhaps, that we probably could come up with some kind of objective rankings, like this person is a bigger sinner or a greater sinner than, than this person in some way, right? I, I think there's some truth to that. Um, so, for example... Um, let's say, I don't know. Actually, yeah, let's do this real quick. Can, can I have a couple of volunteers? I just need you to stand there. It's three, three, three guys since, since we're going to have um, uh, people be these, these people. Okay. Okay, one. Someone, someone else want to stand? Come on. Steve. Okay, one more. One more guy. Come on. Daniel. Okay, thank you. All right. You know what? You will be your namesake. You will be Daniel, but the Daniel in Bible. All right. Righteous man. Okay. So there's Daniel. Okay. Steve. Well, uh, because I know you, you're Hitler. Okay. Well, we're going to say you're Hitler. And then uh, Alan here will be Paul, will be the apostle Paul. Okay. So um, let's have a sister, uh, a sister volunteer. Can some, you're just going to um, assign them, but someone bold enough 
to, to do this? Sister, come on. Pick someone. Alyssa, Alyssa, how about you? Okay, why don't you, why don't you come on up, okay? You, you could come up here, actually, a little bit. Come here. Okay, so if we are ordering these three, let's say we'll, we'll make it easier because kind of, kind of in that way. Let's say that's, that's hell, okay? That's, that's closer to hell, all right? That's, that's the, the chief of, or that's the worst of sinners if we're doing that, that, that area. Where would you assign these three people? Okay, Hitler, Daniel in the Bible, okay, and then the Apostle Paul. How would you do so? Just generally speaking. So you want to tell Steve to keep going over there? Yeah. Okay, Steve, you keep going over there. Okay. Where would you put Daniel? Well, more over here. Okay. And you keep him near Paul? Okay. Okay. Now let's see one more. I need one more guy, volunteer. Just someone stand up. John. How about you, John? Okay, it's good. Okay, Alyssa, wait. Now John, John is Jesus. Now again, this is sinner to righteous. Where would you put where would you put John then? John, go outside. Go outside the parking lot. Like, just keep going. Guess, <laughs> go, as, go as far as you could go. Okay. Now, now, okay. John's over there. He's representing Jesus. You have Paul, you have Daniel, you have Hitler. Okay. Now, I know we can't see because we don't have an unlimited space, etc. But where do you think Paul and Daniel? would be in comparison to Jesus and in comparison to Hitler? Would you move them at all? No? Okay. Would anyone else? <laughs> okay, okay, we'll get back to that. Now let me ask you this, where would you put yourself? <laughs> right there, you're just right where you are, kind of like that. So not as righteous as them and more righteous than Hitler and kind of over there, okay. Here's the point, guys, and you guys don't have to move, thank you. But in comparison to Jesus, first of all, all of, all of you here would be all grouped together. Right? You guys would be closer together than you are anyone's closer to Christ, including Paul, right? That's what Paul is saying there, okay? And, and if you yourself had to put yourself in this group, or if any of us had to put ourselves in this group, we would be linked here with, if we put Hitler and Stalin or whatever else, we would be linked and closer to that group, much closer to there, than we are to Christ. See, that's a, that's a eternal, not an internal distance, but that's a huge distance, right? And the only way that that has been reconciled is through Christ, okay? But you see, that's what, thank you, you guys could sit down. Thank you, that, that's what Paul is saying here. That's what Paul is saying here, okay? He's the chief of sinners, right? One, he knows his place in light of Christ and what Christ has done, okay? And how he compares himself in that sense and how he falls way short, way short, Right? In anything of himself, um, in his own righteousness. Right? But it's through Christ and Christ alone. But he recognizes um, how sinful he is in that way. Okay? And so subjectively, the one who has been saved knows or should know just how sinful they are. Right? And so that's why, yes, I think in our humanness, we may say, I'm not as bad as this person. But in light of the gospel, in light of grace, and in light of our own hearts, and you truly knowing your heart like no one else knows your heart, if we are honest, if we are true about that, we, we, we keep moving that way because we recognize the sin in our own hearts and our lives. Right? And our absolute need for God's grace. So that's what Paul means when he's saying he's the chief of sinners. But I want you guys to notice something else, too, about what he says. He says, um, of who, at the end of 15, again, Jesus, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. I, I, I highlight, I, I uh, sit on that word, am. What is he saying? He's saying this now. He's saying this in the present this wasn't Paul just talking about, I used to do these things to Christians. I was, he was a persecutor. He was a blasphemer. He did do these things in his past. So yes, he was a great sinner, and he recognizes that. But he's also saying, now I am the chief of sinners. Presently, I am still the chief of sinners. Okay. Now, this wasn't Paul beating himself up. This wasn't false humility. This was actually a little bit of boasting in a, in a good way. Because you know what he was saying when he was saying that is um, he was realizing, again, uh, 
the sinfulness that he had, not only when he was converted and when he first came to Christ, but as he grew, he became more and more aware of his sin. Um, so, you know, when a person uh, first comes to Christ, when they're initially converted, when you repent and you have faith, the reality of our sin should hit us. I mean, it should be genuine, of course, right? Um, we should, we should uh, be convicted of our sin. Um, we may uh, have godly sorrow. We should have godly sorrow. Um, and that may cause us to, you know, even weep, um, to repent, of course, and then to have faith. But the extent of our sinfulness actually grows as we continue to walk with Christ. And so the longer we walk and we grow with Christ, the more we recognize how sinful we are. Now, now this doesn't mean that we actually sin more in our lives. It's not like, oh, I've been a Christian and so I get to sin more. I get to, you know, because of God's grace. No, it's not that. We may actually outwardly look a lot different. You may, and, and, and we should, we should not continue to do the things that we once did, especially before we knew Christ. But in our hearts and in our own wrestling, we recognize that there's a lot of pride. Um, there's these desires that we still continue to have, even though we don't want to have them. The way we treat others, perhaps, we, we recognize the sinfulness in our own hearts through that. But we, as the longer we grow, we become more sensitive to sin. And God's holiness and the awareness of his holiness grows. And again, like I said, we know how sinful our hearts are. No one else but us knows that. And so Paul's conclusion is truly not only subjective, but it is objective. It is true. I am the chief of sinners. The more you walk with Christ, the more you will say this. Yes. Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. And I can't speak for anyone else, but, but what I know of my own life and my own heart is I'm number one. I'm the worst of them. My heart is the most filled with sin. Right? Again, it's not a way to beat yourselves up, but it's what Paul does ultimately. He rejoices in this. There's celebration of the gospel and the grace of God in Christ. And so the mercy of God displayed in his life and my life results in God receiving all the praise and glory. And that's what it means to celebrate the gospel again and again in our lives because Christ has shown his grace initially when we became saved, but he continues to do that in our lives. And ultimately, whatever good comes from our lives, it's all for his glory. It's because of his grace. It's because he saved the sinner like me and he's continued to work in a sinner like me. And so that's what we celebrate when we celebrate the gospel and when we celebrate Christ. He gets the glory. Um, Paul Washer was talking about sanctification. Paul Washer is a preacher, YouTube guy, if you, if you see him. Uh, some of you know who he is. But uh, anyways, he was actually talking about growth, sanctification in the Christian life. And uh, it was interesting because he said that, you know, he had a big conversion um, when he first came to Christ. In that first year or two, he changed dramatically. Right? A lot of changes in his life from the way he was. But he confessed that after being a Christian for about 35, 40 years by that point, as he was sharing, he said he had expected to grow more by this point, to, to change more, to be more different. Right? He didn't expound. Maybe it could have been you know, how he talks to certain people, maybe how he treats his wife. I, I don't know. Right? But he, he said like, he would have expected that he would have grown more by this point even though there had been growth in his life. But he said this, there is one area where he has experienced continual growth, light speed growth, and that growth has continued for all these years. And you know what that area was? It was his recognition of his absolute need for God's grace. As he continued in Christ, that's where he grew the most. He recognized his absolute need for God's grace. Um, and uh, it's interesting because, you know, John Newton, John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, which we sang, right? You know what he said once? He said um, something along these lines. He said, when he gets to heaven, he said to others, he would have the bragging rights over everyone else in this one area, 
So he said, when I get to heaven, I will be able to boast about this one thing over everybody else. I know it kind of sounds arrogant. But you know what his boast was? He said this, that out, out of all of God's children, I needed grace the most. I needed grace the most. That was his boast. And that's what he said, when I get to heaven, that's what I'm going to boast of and be able to say truly for anyone else, that out of all of his children, I needed grace the most. And so there's this celebration of the gospel because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And then Paul says, and that leads to that, he received mercy. And as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And then verse 17, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He's celebrating the grace of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ in his life and in the church. And so we are to do that. We keep the gospel center by celebrating the gospel and how much we need his grace in us. And then lastly, in this passage, the centrality of the gospel, uh, keeping the gospel center, is also done by fighting for the gospel. Fighting for the gospel. Or, or um, in your notes, just fight. I think that's how it's said. Yes, fight for it. Fight for it. We are called to fight for the gospel in our midst. And so in verse 18, Paul says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. So Paul charges Timothy here to wage the good warfare when it comes to the gospel and the enemies of it. He's to do so by holding faith and a good conscience. So victory comes through perseverance in faith and integrity to the gospel. It's not only teaching and saying the right things, you know, having sound doctrine, but it's living them out in obedience and integrity. Right? But what he's saying is that we must be ready in the church um, and, and the, the church must continue to fight for the gospel and we must be willing to do that as well in our lives. And so this fight happens specifically in our lives. Okay? We must uh, con constantly fight for the gospel in our lives and in the church in our lives and in the church. In our lives, we have to fight for the gospel in our hearts and minds. Um, there's two quotes uh, that, that speak to this fight in our own lives, in our own, in our own hearts and minds. Uh, the first one maybe deals with more of our hearts. So, so hear this. And for some of you, and well, for all of us actually, it applies. But for some, maybe you struggle with this a little bit more right now than others. Here's the first quote. More people leave Christ and his church for love for the world more than anything else. I believe John Piper said that. More people leave Christ and his church for love for the world more than anything else. That's, that's where we have to fight for the gospel in our hearts. Because even though you may be in the church, you may say you follow Christ, the desires of the world, your wants for the things of the world seem better than Christ, seem tastier, seem sweeter. And so in your heart, you have to constantly fight that. And most people, it is true, when they leave Christ and when they leave the church, it's not because of a bad experience. I mean, that can partly be due to it. But oftentimes, most oftentimes, it's because the, because the person ultimately said, I, I love the world. And I want the things of this world more than I want Christ. And we all know that struggle. But we have to fight for that in our hearts. Okay? We have to fight for the gospel in our hearts when it comes to the love of the world and seeing Christ as more satisfying, beautiful, and pleasurable. Now, the second quote is, is more of our minds, perhaps. But here's another quote. I, I'm not sure who said this. I, I remember hearing it. Um, but he said, people leave the church and Christ not because they believe in nothing, but because they believe in anything. People leave the church in Christ, not because they believe in nothing, but be because they believe in anything. So this is a more of a mind issue. This is where 
having sound doctrine, understanding what the Bible teaches about the church is paramount. It teaches about the gospel is paramount. It teaches about the cross is paramount. Because there are people in the church, they start hearing something else. They fall over Christ and then they start hearing something else in the world or someone else says something about the Bible that's not true. And then they think like, oh, actually, that sounds cool. Or, or basically it's like, I'll believe in anything. Because you don't truly believe in what you're supposed to believe. You don't truly know what you're supposed to know as a follower of Christ, as a Christian, and the gospel of Christ. And so we have to fight for the gospel in our minds as well. We have to study. We have to look truth. We have to have sound doctrine in our lives. And then we also have to fight for the gospel in our homes, in our marriages. You know, we can drift from the gospel. We can move away from God's grace. I know those of you who are parents, you know this. But parenting is hard, but Christian parenting is really hard as well, uh, maybe more so. Um, now, this is what you may do as parents, and I struggle with this as well. It's, it's kind of like what we talked about last week about some extremes, you know, the, the legalistic way or the antinomian, kind of like, you know, let them do whatever they want. Some parents, they could be just all law, all law. And the law is good, like we said, because it directs us to our Savior. And it gives some boundaries. And so every household needs law. Please don't think any of you as parents like, oh, I'm not going to have boundaries. I'm not going to have law. I'm not going to set things. No, the Bible does that. And we should as well. Right? But if that's all there is, then it's going to be you know, destructive. Um, it's, it's going to be ugly. Right? We're going to be trying to do things all in our own strength. Right? But then the other extreme, too, of kind of a antinomian, like anti-law, licentiousness is, for our kids is we could be like, I just want to be their friend or I want to make sure they always feel good. I want to make sure they're happy and, you know, give them what they want. And, you know, that's how we'll win their heart. That's how we'll do that. I'm not going to do that. You're just feeding their sin. You're just feeding their selfishness. And that's not helping them. That's going to be more, more destructive ultimately probably, to be, to be honest, right? And so we need the law. You need that, but to direct them to the gospel. And so undergirding our parenting has to be the gospel. Right? But, but we have God's law as well, and we set those things too. Right? So we have to fight for that. We have to fight for that in our households, how we parent, how we treat our children, how we have conversations with them as well. Right? But we have to fight for the gospel in our lives um, uh, all the time. And then he says, we have to fight for the gospel in the church, in the church, because there will be those who pervert the gospel. There will be those who add or take away from it or even deny it. And we cannot allow that in Jesus' church. And so we must fight. You know, I've, I've said and, and I'm against and uh, other pastors have said that too. And I believe that's biblical. But, you know, the prosperity gospel, any forms of it where it's, you know, God wants us to be healthy, wealthy and happy. That's not in scriptures. Okay? And the problem with that, the big problem with that, I think, is ultimately this. If in your life you're a follower of Christ and your health is poor or you get sick or you lose your job or you're discouraged and sad or, or whatever, then you're going to think ultimately based on that gospel that God must not love me because I'm not healthy right now. I'm not wealthy right now. I'm not happy. And so God must not love me then. And that's not true. Right? And so the Bible never preaches, never says that the gospel is based on our health, wealth and happiness. In fact, the followers of Christ will suffer oftentimes. And so that's an insidious, horrible form of the gospel. And there are churches that are huge, huge in the world that are preaching this and saying, God wants your best life now. Jesus came to, you know, if you're sick, you must not have enough faith. No, we're sick. We're all going to get sick and die in this world, right? Our, our hope is eternal. And the, and the Bible has made that clear. Okay? And, and so we have to fight against those things as well in the church. And so we fight for the gospel against his, his lies. And so what Paul also uses as an example here in the close of these, these verses is Paul was willing to wage war for the gospel in this church in Ephesus, so much so that two perhaps leaders in the church, Hymenaeus and Alexander, and if they weren't leaders, they were people of influence within the church. You know, they, they, they talked to people, they conversed, they had influence over them. What does he do? He says he handed them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So Paul confronted them and he actually excommunicated them from the church. You know, that can happen even in the church as well when we talk about church discipline. 
that's the extreme form of church discipline. But there may be times where you might have to say, especially to those who are preaching a different gospel, like you cannot remain because of what you are doing and how you're perverting the gospel, the truth, right? But Paul wasn't doing this because he was trying to be punitive, ultimately. He wanted to guard the church. He wanted to keep out lies. Yes, and that's important. But he was also doing it, I believe, and we see this elsewhere when it comes to church discipline, that Hymenaeus and Alexander, that by handing them over to Satan, by allowing them to go into the world, that they would recognize, if they were truly saved, the error of their ways. That they would, they would be awakened to that. And so in that, that would lead them to repentance and lead them to humility and lead them to, I'm under the gospel and I want to share that and, and the authority even of the church in that sense and, and, and I'm, I'm willing to do that. That's what it was for. Right? That's what Paul was hoping. So in that sense, he was fighting not only for the church but also for those who strayed away from it and from Christ so that the unity of the church and the unity of the gospel could continue to, to, to be true in the church. And so the gospel must be center. The gospel must be center. We have to guard it. We should celebrate it. And we have to fight for it right? in our own lives and in our churches. So Faith Harvest, we are Christ's church. It belongs to him. He created it. He will sustain it. This is not our church. We're not running it. We aren't creating content. We aren't making it grow. We are members of his body. He is the head. We exist to make him known and glorious and not ourselves. And we must be rooted in his gospel and his word. He has revealed himself through his word. And so we must not preach or teach from any other source. And we must never stray from the gospel. We must guard it. We must fight for it. We must celebrate it. And that is, as his church, we are to make much of him. We are to make much of him. That's who we are. That's who we should be. That's who he's growing us to be. And as long as we are centered on the gospel and his word, we will stay in those lanes. And he calls us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your marvelous, glorious gospel. That Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost, God. And I, I do pray that not only me as I say these things, but the hearts of those sitting here as well would sit on that for a moment and be reminded of the glorious grace that you have shown in Christ to us who are the chief of sinners, Lord. And that should not only cause us to be humble, that should also cause us to be joyful, that we could celebrate such a great grace as that which you have given to us in Christ. That we could be like John Newton said, out of all of his children, we needed grace the most. So we thank you for that. And we want to celebrate that in our midst. We want to celebrate that in the lives of those who have come to know you maybe recently and in the lives of those who, as they grow in holiness and recognize more of who you are, they understand more just how sinful they are and how, they, how we continually need your grace day by day, Lord. And it amazes us that you supply that for us, God. Oh, that we celebrate and we, we praise you for your glorious grace in the gospel, Lord. And Lord, that we also fight for this gospel too in our midst, in our own lives. We confess that in our hearts, in our lives, we drift easily. We could be good one week, maybe even one day, and the next day, Lord, we're a mess and we forget your gospel so easily. We depend upon your, ourselves so, so easily, naturally, God. We, we look to the things of the world and they seem so tempting so quickly, even to a heart that is experienced and tasted of your goodness. And so we have to fight for your gospel, for Jesus in our hearts to be center all the time, Lord. And so help us in our households, in our hearts, in our minds, in our marriages, with our children, God, in all our relationships, we pray and also especially in our church, Lord. And so may we know your gospel more, may we understand it more, and may we guard it, Lord, in our midst as well. We want to be a people that follow and, and preach it and proclaim it and share it with others, God, so that ultimately, Jesus, this is how we know that you are getting the glory, that you are being made much of. And so we pray that would be taking place in the hearts of your people and in this church as well, we pray. So we thank you. Thank you that you are in the midst of us and you are working. Would you continue to do so, Lord, we pray.
So we give this time to you, God. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close, uh, continue.